So we're, yeah, we're winding down now in John chapter 10, getting to a, a, a curious statement that Jesus made. This was right after, yeah. right after Jesus said, uh, said, I and the father are one. Wait, wait, well, let me back up a little further. This is where he said, said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. That was, I think that's a, a, uh, oh, what do you want to say? Uh, something that gives us assurance that we know, we know we're one of Jesus' sheep when we, when we hear his voice and we follow him. And, you know, it's not necessarily a, an audible voice, but we're, we're, we're trusting in Jesus. We're listening to what he says and we're, we're, uh, we're following his leading. So, and then he, he said, he, he said, I give you, I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one shall snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. And Tom, you brought up a great point, you know, snatching, you know, like, you know, like you're like a, I don't know, like trying to snatch a candy bar out of somebody's hand. The, the father, he's never caught off guard. He's Satan isn't going to be able to snatch us out. Father's never sleeping or slumbering. No one can catch him off guard and, and snatch us out of his hand. Reminds it's kind of like Mama Bear. Oh, go ahead, Tom. No, I was just going to say it's, it's just kind of like you when you take something like that, you're taking it when the person is like not being aware or they aren't looking or something like that. You know, you just reach out and grab it, like, oh, I can get it now. And the like enemy a, does that to us, you know, like a purse snatcher. You, when, Let your guard down. Right. When you, when the, the lady has her guard down or she's distracted, they come up and they snatch the purse away. Yeah. God's never, his guard's never down. He's never going to be caught off guard. Yeah. Go ahead, Sandra. You had something to share? Yeah. It reminds me of a mama bear and someone trying to take her cubs, you know, what's she going to do? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> get between mama and her cubs. No. <laughs> yeah, and our heavenly Father is probably. I would think it's safe to say he's even more protective of us than a mama bear is of her cubs. And yeah, no one's gonna snatch the cubs away, and no one's gonna snatch us away from out of his hands. Yeah, thank, thank you, Sandra. That's a that's a great illustration. It's interesting you said that because Deb Deb just mentioned that yesterday. Because uh, you know we, we live up in the mountain and we have bears around the house sometimes and. And uh, that's something we always we bring the bird feeders in at night because the the, the bears love the bird feeders. They they'll, they'll destroy them. And and Deb said, you know, we she, every time she goes out, she's always looking, making sure there's not a bear out there, and even more important, making sure there's not a mama with her cubs because the last thing you want to do is get between mama and her cubs. So, yeah. So thank you, Sandra, for bringing that up. Mm. All right. So no one's gonna snatch them out of my father's hands. I and the Father are one, and that's that. Uh, it, as if the the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders, weren't already irate with Jesus. They picked up stones to stone him because they knew they knew what he was claiming. I and the Father are one. You're you're claiming to be God, and Jesus said, "I'm I'm sh I show you many good works from the Father. Which of these are you stoning me?" Jesus knew, you know, why they were stoning him. He just he just went, you know, yeah, when Jesus asks questions, he's not trying to get information from us. He's trying to cause us to look at ourselves, to examine our hearts. Why am I, why am I doing the things I'm doing? And that's why he's saying, it. he says, why are you doing that? Are you doing that because I, you know, I did some good works from the father. And they said, no, the Jews answered, they said, no, we're not doing it for any good work. We're not stoning you because you did any good works. We're doing it because of blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself out to be God. So they, they thought, that, you know, they just considered Jesus to be a, a man, a good man, perhaps, because they, they admitted, they said there wasn't anything, you know, there wasn't anything, uh, you didn't do anything wrong, it wasn't because many of these works that you did, uh, that's not why we're standing you, it's because you're claiming to be God, and, and, uh, and if, and if Jesus, I've, I've said this before, but if Jesus wasn't God, that would have been valid for, for them to stone him because in Leviticus, uh, where is that? Uh, Leviticus 24, 16, if anybody who blasphemes the name, they're to be stoned to death. So that would have been blaspheming the name of God. If you're claiming, if I'm claiming to be God, that would be blasphemy if I'm not. So anyway, that's why they were wanting to stone him. And then down that's where we stopped last time so they were stoning jesus because he 
He claimed to be God. He's making himself out to be God. And they thought he was just a mere man. And verse 34, have you ever been puzzled by that statement? I still am, man. I read up on it. I, I still am. It, it's puzzling, isn't it? Jesus says, in verse 34, Jesus answered them, has it not been written in your law, that would be the law of the Jews, or the, the law of Moses, uh, I said, you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, blaspheming because I said, I am the son of God? So this, this comes from Psalm 82, I believe it is. 82. Yeah, it is 82. Let's go take a look at that, because that's, that's very puzzling. So Psalm 82. Okay, Psalm 82 says, God, this is a Psalm of Asaph. It says, God takes his stand in his own congregation. He judges in the midst of the rulers or the, or the judges. How long will you judge unjustly? He's talking to the rulers, the judges, the magistrates, judges. He says, he says how long will you judge unjustly? And, and actually, the, uh, depending on your translation, the NIV and the King James, it says that he judges in the midst of the gods, the little g, G-O-D-S. The, the word reference, the word that's used there is Elohim. It's the same word that's often used to describe God, but it also can be used to describe little g gods. Okay? Now, now you're even more puzzled, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> you're not helping, Jim. I'm making <laughs> money in the waters. <laughs> so, so anyway, God presides. He takes his stand in his own congregation. He judges in the midst of the rulers or the, the magistrates or the judges or the Elohim, the gods. How long will you judge unjustly? Okay, so these gods or these judges, they're judging unjustly. Unjust, so, and how long will you show partiality to the wicked? You're supposed to vindicate the weak and the fatherless. You're supposed to do justice to the afflicted and the destitute. You're to rescue the weak and the needy. You're to deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods. You are the judges or the magistrates. You are, you are gods. And all of you are sons of the Most High. So you're sons of God. Nevertheless, you will die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for it is thou who dispossess possess all the nations. So, yeah, let's see if I can dig us out of this hole. It's, it's the judges. It's those that were appointed as representatives of, of God. Um, and it could be the, the judges, it could be the prophets, they're represented, representative of God, you know, they're the, the man, they refer to them often as, you know, man of God, like Elijah or whatever, so, oh, man of God. And, and some even refer to them as, as gods, not, not God Almighty, not uh, Yahweh, but as acting in, in God's behalf. And so just like, uh, well, like Peter said, you know, holy men of old spoke as God, the Holy Spirit moved them. They were, they were acting on behalf of God. So why, why they were called gods, I don't know. But the main point of what Jesus is saying here, he's, he's not saying to elevate them to, to a position of deity. He's, he's pointing out their hypocrisy because this was the law, the Psalms. This was what the, the Pharisees, the Jews used. That was their law book. They referred to these judges, these prophets as gods, little g gods. And yet, and they didn't consider that blasphemy, but yet they're, they're saying Jesus is blaspheming because he said that he is the son of God. So it was the main point that Jesus is saying here is he's pointing out their hypocrisy. Okay, if you're going to call these prophets and these judges gods and not stone them to death, why are you stoning me to death? Because I said I'm the son of God. If, if, if what I'm saying is blasphemy, that's even more blasphemous for you to call them gods 
because they're, they're mere men that are being appointed. They're acting on God's behalf. Is that still not helping, is it? <laughs> not, not really. Uh, okay. Um, let's go to, let's go to Exodus 21, where that, that word is used. And it's, it's Elohim is the original. Elohim, yeah. Exodus 21. Exodus 21, verse 6. Um, okay, Exodus 21. This is talking about uh, a slave says, we'll go back to verse 5. If a, plain, if a slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out as a free man. This is someone who wants to remain as a bond servant. His master is treating him very well and says, I, I don't want to go free. I want to stay with this master. And his master shall bring him to God. Depending on your translation, it, it might say the judges. King James here actually says he'll bring him to the judges. The, the word there is Elohim. So he'll bring him to either Elohim, and, it, and the reason the translations are different because it could be translated either as, as God, Elohim, or the, the judges, Elohim. So he'll bring him to the judges or to God, the judges being the ones that are act, acting as God's representatives. And he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him permanently. Okay, so anyway, that I, I brought up that reference just because that's another place where the, the word Elohim is used, and some, some translations refer translated as God, some translated as judges. Uh, one more, we'll go over one page to Exodus 22, verse 8. Okay, Exodus 22, verse 8 talks about a, a man well let's we'll back up to verse seven the man gives his neighbor money or goods to keep for him and it's stolen from the man's house if the thief is caught he shall pay double if the thief is not caught then the owner of the house shall appear before the judges some translations say he'll, be, he'll appear before god it's it's elohim again he'll appear before the judges or appear before god to determine whether he laid his hands on his neighbor's property so it's the judges, but they're acting on behalf of God. It's, it's a human, human being acting on behalf of God, on behalf of Elohim. It's, I, I don't know why. I, <laughs> that's about the best I can offer you. It's, it, uh, maybe it doesn't help at all. But. So that's, that's what Psalm 82 is about. It's, it's about the judges, those that are acting on behalf of God, judging unjustly. And he says, I said, you are gods, you are Elohim, you're acting on my behalf. All of you are sons of the Most High, but you will die like mere men, because they are mere men. They're just acting on behalf of God. So, anyway, anybody have any additional insight to clear it up at all? It's still puzzling, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, I think it, I, I agree. It was not it was not a compliment to tell them that it was it was because all these agencies that that man had been put into, like judges, but there were judges before the kings, and they were they were like the sovereign authority that God had put in place, right. and He created those positions. It wasn't like it wasn't like a man-made position or anything. It was something exactly. that God ordained. So when they don't listen to Him. You know, I mean, we've seen a lot of those guys get in trouble for that mm -hmm. and they weren't honoring him. And maybe that's I guess that's the same sort of uh, attitude that's going on here. Yeah. And, well, and I think I think that's it. Exactly. God had ordained these judges. God had appointed them and they're acting on his behalf. So, yeah, if you're not honoring those judges, those people put on his behalf, you're, you're not honoring God. You're dishonoring God. So they're they're not. Yeah, I mean, they're acting on behalf of God, so they're... They need to represent them correctly. Right, yeah, right. It's like, exactly. it's, it's like deacons in church, you know, they, it's like you've got, a, you've got an extra thing that people are watching, or if you're a pastor, you've got, yeah. you better be living up to the word. Amen. Doing your best to it. Heavy, heavy responsibility, yeah, because you're, you're representing God, 
and actually in a sense you know we're all our all believers are representing god aren't we we're right second corinthians 5 20 we're his we're christ's ambassadors we're representing christ to the world so and and some people you know they look to us you know when you have an unbeliever that's got a health crisis where they do oftentimes they'll come find a christian hey can you pray for me because they know that you're you're acting on behalf of god you've got a connection to god that they don't have yeah uh, all right so i'll let it slide yeah that's that's the best <laughs> i can do um I'll, I'll trust the holy spirit to yeah to yes. bring enlightenment in, in his good timing all right so Anyway, yeah, I think so. When I when I read this in John ten, I, I think Jesus is, again is exposing their hypocrisy because they're not they don't stone these judges that they they refer to them as gods. You're referring to them as gods. You don't blast. You don't stone them for blasphemy. So why are you stoning? Why are you trying to stone me for blasphemy? So I'm not doing anything uh, that they don't that they're not doing. And I and I'm actually, yeah, I think right there he's saying that what they're doing is wrong. I mean, that's what I, right there he's saying that. Yeah. Yeah. And again, he said, and he follows up with, he says, says, okay, well, let, let me expound on verse 36 a little more. Or let's go back to 35. He said, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, okay, so the word of God came to the, the prophets and to the judges and to the priests and to the, the authors of the scripture, didn't it? The, the word of God came to them. So that's so why he called them gods because the word of God came to them directly, okay? And the scripture cannot be broken. They knew that they, the scripture, it was, not, they knew it could not be broken. They held the scripture, the, the Jewish religious, the scribes and Pharisees, they held the scripture in the highest regard. And the scripture cannot be broken. So if they called them God, the ones to whom the word of God came, said, do you say of him whom the father sanctified? That's Jesus. He was sanctified by the father, set apart for a specific purpose. He was sent into the world. Jesus was sent into the world by the father. Are you saying to him, you are blaspheming because I said I am the son of God. I don't know if there's any other places in scripture, I can't think of any other places where Jesus was so direct, where he direct actually came out and said, I am the son of God. That's, that's the same place I can think of. Because, you know, you, you, you'll hear skeptics say, oh, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. And right there, he says, I am the son of God. You know, normally, where, where, where's uh, I and the father are one? Where's, I mean, uh, that's, that's right that's here. A, we just read that, right? 1030, right. Yeah. Right. Um. But you've heard skeptics say, you know, Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, I mean, this, I don't think you can get any more plain. I guess it could get more plain. I don't know. But right, I mean, right there, he says, I am the son of God. He says, I am the father of one. It's and also the other instance where God said himself, he said, this is my son in mm -hmm. whom I am well pleased. Amen. Excellent. Thank you, Sandra. Yeah, voice voice from heaven. And I think that's going to come up in... Didn't he talk about creation, too, being together with God? It's... Well, John 1, John 1, 1 talked about that. I don't I don't know if Jesus ever directly said it. Uh, John... Oh, oh, okay. In the beginning was be. the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Um, uh, let's see, where is it? I think it's in... I think it's going to come up here in chapter 11 or 12, uh, something similar to what you just shared, Sandra, where, let's see, where is it? Where, where God, anyway, God spoke and, well, we'll get to it probably in a couple of weeks. And some of the people dismissed it. They said, oh, it sounded like thunder. You know, God has given has given uh, evidence you know, throughout history that Jesus is his one and only son. And, but, but the skeptics are going to, they're going to deny it, whether they say all, oh, you know, that wasn't God speaking, that was just thunder or, you know, however, whatever they want to come up with as an excuse. But anyway, so thanks for bringing that up, Sandra. The God the Father spoke, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. 
So, all right, back to John chapter 10, verse 36. Why do you say to him, you're blaspheming? Because I said the son of God. Jesus followed up by saying in verse 37, if I do not do the works of my father, then don't believe me. You know, look at the evidence. And, and that's something I think that we can use when someone wants to argue the gospel with us. You know, look at the evidence. You know, don't, don't trust what I'm saying. Look at the evidence. Look at the word of God. Did Jesus, you know, did Jesus do what he said he did? Is there any evidence? Do you see changed lives? You know, um, fulfilled prophecies. You know, look look at the evidence, look at the word, the, 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 the scriptures yourself, and ask God to reveal himself to you. If, when you read it and say, okay, God, if this is true, you know, show it to me. And, you know, we, we can't, you know, I've tried it, we can't argue someone into the kingdom of heaven, we can't, we can have the best, we can be the best debater, and it's, if it's falling on deaf ears, ears that don't hear, it's, you know, we're wasting our breath. It's, you know, the Holy Spirit's the one that has to open their eyes, open their hearts, and, you know, just have them examine the evidence and look to God. So Jesus says, if, I'm, if I don't do the works of my Father, then don't believe me. You know, examine the evidence. But if I do them, if I am doing the works of the Father, even though you don't believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Now, that's another powerful statement, isn't it? The Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Plus the fact that he had just asked them, which of my good things are you stoning me for? You know, mm. those were all good miracles and things. Signs, yeah. Yeah. Signs pointing to his divinity. Yeah. Yeah, so, so how they respond when he says this, that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Verse 39. There, they're seeking again to seize him. There's no doubt in their mind what Jesus is claiming here. He's claiming to be the son of God. The father is in me and I'm in the father. He's claiming deity. They, they were seeking to seize him. He eluded their grasp. And that's kind of interesting. I, I pointed out last time. Do you remember where he was at this time? This was at the Feast of Dedication. But we'll back up to verse 22. This was at the Feast of Dedication, about two months after, there's a two-month break here between the, the Feast of Tabernacles, and then now we come to the Feast of Dedication. So he's at Jerusalem again. He was at Solomon's porch. He was at, in the temple in the portico of Solomon, and it's on the eastern side of the temple between the, the most holy place and the, or no, it's the court of the Gentiles is between the porch and the most holy place. So he's out on the Far right, uh, far right, or far east part of the temple, and there's the end of it, the end of the porch. There's either a drop off, a cliff, or there's a wall. So if you're standing out there, and they were surrounding him, they uh, verse 24, the Jews were gathered around him, so he was surrounded. They're saying, "How long will you keep us in suspense if you're the Christ?" So there's no place for him to go. They're surrounding him. They're picking up stones. They're wanting to stone him. And now they're ready to seize him, but he eluded their grasp. How he did that, I, I don't know. John doesn't record that, but there was, he was surrounded and there was nowhere to go. So uh, I think right there again, he's showing his divinity, how he could have possibly escaped their grasp when they had him surrounded. So anyway, so he, he eluded their grasp. And then... And then, okay, verse 40, and he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing. He was staying there. Do you remember where, where John was first baptizing? It's in John chapter 1, around verse 20 or so. I find it interesting that, that the apostle John described it that way and didn't just say where it was. He said he went to the place where John was first baptizing. So we go back to John chapter 1. And we see that, let's see, around verse 20, I think, 20, 28. Yeah, 28. John chapter 1, verse 28. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. Okay, so beyond the Jordan. So he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing, and he was staying there. Okay, so I went to Bethany. Bethany is, do you know, what do you know about Bethany? 
He, he left Jerusalem and went to Bethany. Bethany, it's about two miles east of Jerusalem. It's on the eastern uh, slope of the Mount of Olives. It's where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were. Amen. Yeah, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And we'll see that in, in when we get to chapter 11. It's, it's the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Lazarus. And uh, Jesus spent a good bit of time there in Bethany. And uh, well, in John 11, 1, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Okay, so Jesus, he left Jerusalem, went to Bethany. And there's a couple other things that happened there in Bethany. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, and we'll, we'll jump to chapter 12. We'll get to chapter 12, verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany again, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Okay, so right before the Passover, he comes to Bethany again. This is going to be before the triumphal en entry. And we'll see that in, it's in Mark, let's say Mark 11. So we're getting close to the end here, getting close to the, the Passover, the final Passover where Jesus is going to be arrested. Mark 11, Mark 11, verse 1, they approached Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives. Okay, so Bethany, it's near the Mount of Olives, it's on the eastern slope, about two miles from Jerusalem. So he sent two of his disciples, said, go into the village, find a colt there, a donkey, and untie it. They put their garments on it, spread out the garments in the road. This is the triumphal entry. So he entered Jerusalem, verse 11. He entered Jerusalem, came into the temple, and after looking all around, he departed for Bethany with the 12. And then right after that, the next day, they departed from Bethany. He became hungry. That's where he saw the fig tree. In leaf, but there's no, no fruit on it. He cursed the fig tree and he went into the temple. So we're getting close to the end here, close to the triumphal entry, close to the last Passover where Jesus is going to be slain as the as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, the lamb of God that takes away our sins. So verse 40, he went away from beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing, which is Bethany. He was staying there, and it looks like, uh, yeah, he's staying at Bethany. Many came to him. They were saying, while John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man, Jesus, was true, and many believed in him there. So they many believed in Jesus there in Bethany based on the, the signs that were performed, based on what the testimony of John. John didn't know miraculous sign but yet everything he said about jesus was true so that's pretty much the end of chapter 10 so what do, what do we conclude so there was a lot in chapter 10 remember that started out with the jesus saying that he he's the good shepherd actually started out by saying that he's the door and everybody who tries to get in the sheep some other way climbs in other way and by the door is a, is a thief and a robber. Remember that? Whoever enters by the door is, is a shepherd. It says, I am the door. I am the good shepherd. Good shepherd laid down his life. So we get a lot about his identity in this chapter. A, a lot of what kind of identity? Of Christ's identity. Hmm. Amen. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, what? he's not mincing any words, man. Yeah, yeah, he, he gets to the point, doesn't he? he? Yeah, he's flat out honest there. Yeah, so he's the door, the only way enter, to enter in the sheepfold. He's the good shepherd, the only one that's going to lay down his life for the sheep to, to pay for our sins. Yeah, and he said uh in verse 18 he says i'm says no one's taken my life away from me i lay it down of my own accord i have authority from the father to lay it down and the authority from the father to take it back up again 
And, and, and that, that was how many times did they try to stone him here in chapter 10? They wanted to stone him for that because that was a claim of deity that the father that I'm, what, what are you saying? You can lay down your own life and take it back up again. Who in the world can do that? You you're either got to be crazy or you've got to be God in human flesh. And they, a lot of them did say, they said, you're, you're crazy. You have a demon, you're insane. But others saw the signs that he performed. He had just opened the eyes of a blind man. They said, this isn't a crazy man. This isn't somebody who's, uh, you know, demon possessed. So, yeah. And then again, he identified himself as, as the son of God multiple times in this chapter. So, I don't know, how, how can we use this to, to share the gospel? How does that help us? And I just think of my attitude. Uh, I think of my, uh, my, sometimes my fear or my lack of passion or something like that. And, mm -hmm. you know, you see that, you know, he's not shrinking in any way whatsoever and uh i mean to me that's a that's a big that's a big lesson good point yeah yeah i shrink back in fear sometimes that somebody's gonna you know reject me or they might you know gee they might laugh at me or yeah <laughs> yeah something that simple they're not gonna yeah. stone me i mean they just might laugh at me and call me an idiot and, yeah you know, tell their friends I'm an idiot. Well, yeah. you're probably right, <laughs> but but not because of what I believe. Yeah, yeah. There, there goes that Bible thumper again, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, he just didn't didn't fear. He never once feared man. He was he told it like it was. All right. Uh, let's see if I have any other notes here. I don't know. I'd... Let's see, many believed in him here. And that's that was the purpose of John's gospel, is that to record these signs that Jesus performed so that you would believe. Let's see, how is that? John 20, verse 30. Many other signs Jesus performed in the presence of the disciples that weren't written in this book. I would suppose, where, where did he say, you know, I suppose if we wrote everything down, all the books in the world could yeah. Uh, it says, but these have been written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So, yeah, many, many believe that. They, they saw the signs and they believed that Jesus was who he claimed to be. He wasn't some kind of madman. He wasn't demon possessed. He wasn't crazy. All right. Well, do you want to continue on chapter 11 or do you want to wait till next week? We can start. We could read it or something, if, okay. even if you're All not right. prepared. Or, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, this is about the death and resurrection of Lazarus, and this was happened in in Bethany. And we, we remember, we called Jesus was in Bethany. We just saw that back in the in the chapter ten, and uh, Lazarus was sick. Probably all. I'm sure you've all heard the story numerous times. Mary and Martha. They all lived together in one house. And it talks about Mary. Mary's the one that anointed the Lord with an ointment, wiped his feet with her hair. And I think that's going to come up. I think it's going to be detailed in chapter 12. Yeah. So John gives us a little preview on that. In chapter 12, he's going to give us the details of, of Mary anointing the Lord's feet. But anyway, he tells us that now. This is He said, this is the same Mary that anointed the Lord with ointment. He wiped, She wiped his feet with her hair. And, and her bro brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters, they sent to Jesus. They said, Lord, behold, the one whom you love is sick. They, they knew Jesus loved Lazarus. And uh, he, was, he was good friends with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He spent time with them on multiple occasions. The one you love is sick. Jesus heard, heard it and said, the sickness is, is not unto death. It's not going to be to death, but it's going to be for the glory of God. So that the Son of God may be glorified by it. There again, he refers to himself as son of God. So that's at least two places where he, where he did it. Um, although at that point, at that statement there, he didn't say, I am the son of God, but he 
but it's a third it's, person. In yeah. Third person. Yeah. Yeah. You often spoke in the third person. Yeah. The son of God or the son of man. Okay. So it's, it's not going to be unto death, but it's for the glory of God. And that falls in line with, with what he shared with us about how the, the trials we go through are for the, for the glory of God. Um, yeah, they, they were, they were worried, you know, Lazarus is going to die. And Jesus is more concerned with, with glorifying the father. And that should be our attitude as well, shouldn't it? I mean, yeah, we, we want, I know it's, it's tempting. We want things to be comfortable and, and, and not have to go through trials, not have to go through painful things. But uh, if we're going to, you know, if we want to glorify God, we're, we're going to go through some trials and, and we should count it all joy. So, said, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And Jesus said, it's, it's not unto death, but it's for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Okay, so Jesus loved Martha. He loved her sister. He loved Lazarus. Made it plain right there. So, therefore, he, he heard that he was, when he heard that he was sick, he stayed there two days longer in the place where he was. What? That doesn't make sense, does it? He just got done saying, he says, Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Therefore, because he loved them, he stayed an extra two days, okay? Wouldn't you think, okay, if he loved them, he's going to, you know, make haste. He's going to beat feet, get over there, and, and heal them right away. But it's, because, it's specifically because he loved them that he waited two days. And, and I think that's important for us. You know, we, you know, God isn't always going to do things the way we expect. Anybody, uh, can I get an amen on that? Anybody? You know, God yeah, does. I think of people all the time saying, you know, God is never on time. He's never on my time, but he's always on time. So yeah, amen. there's a case right there. They they would love to have seen him two days earlier. Amen. Yeah. Go ahead, Sandra. Yeah. Also, I think like when he picks um, us for like to glorify the father, it's because he loves us. So that's kind of like, you know, the son whom he loves, he corrects that, that kind of love, you know? So even though in the natural, we see it as a trial, but really it's him choosing from all the people he chose us for that trial so that God can be glorified. So if we see it that way, it's actually a joy and a privilege. Amen. Amen. Great point. Thanks, Sandra. That's, that's a great attitude to go through. See it, see it as a privilege, as a blessing. You know, it's a blessing to be chosen by God to go through a trial. At, there's a there's a verse I, I don't know if it's in Job or what, but it says that therefore God loves those whom He disciplines. I mean that's yeah. Proverbs three twelve, I believe. Is it? It's in it's. I think it's also in Hebrews twelve, which is a quote of. I think it's Proverbs three twelve. Lord loves those whom He loves. He disciplines as the son that He delights in. Is that the one you're thinking of? Um, I don't. No, that's specifically it. I might have gotten a couple of them. Maybe you combined a couple. They mixed up. I've been known to do that. Proverbs 3.12, I think is what I'm looking for. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves or he disciplines, even as a father, the son in whom he delights. Is that the one you're thinking of? No, it's a little bit different. I mean, that's a okay. that's an awesome verse. I'm not... That, yeah. I'm not discounting that at all, but yeah, I think, think there's that, a couple that are. I think there's a couple of places. It's something along those lines. Yeah. Right. Should I give you another minute to find it? No, nah, go ahead. Go ahead. If yeah. I find it, I'll, I'll all right. bust it in there. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so where was I going with that? So yeah, he okay. He loved loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So therefore, because he loved them, he waited longer. And yeah. And I, yeah, I, I, I've heard, and I've, I've probably made this statement before, and it's not really true. I, 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 I've probably made the statement, you know, Jesus will never disappoint you. But he, he disappointed Mary and Martha, didn't he? At first, at first they were disappointed. In the, in the end, they certainly weren't disappointed. But, but there are going to be times where God disappoints us because, you know, to be disappointed, it, it means something happens that wasn't the way we expected it to happen, right? Or not the way we wanted it to happen. So yeah, God's going to, he's going to disappoint us. There's how many times does God do things away in a way other than what we would have had, we would have wanted him to do. You know, it's, it's a, yeah, go ahead, Tom. 
I did find it. It's, okay. it's Job, Job 517. Okay. Behold, blessed is the one whom God reproves. Therefore, despise not the discipline of the Almighty. Mm, okay. That was one I was thinking of. Okay. That whole verse, that whole chapter is about that. Yeah. Of course, being Job. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So don't despise the, the chastening or the discipline of the Lord because he he's doing it because he loves us. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. Um, Jesus didn't respond the way Mary and Martha wanted. They they were disappointed. They were they were really bummed out about it. If you look, see, he stayed there two days longer in the place where he was. After this, he said to the disciples, "Let us go to Judea again." And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going there again? Yeah, don't, don't you understand, Jesus? They're, they're, they're trying to kill you there. Why do you want to go there again? And Jesus said, There's, are there not 12 hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day and does not stumble because he sees, if anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. And that, that's, I think, key to this whole thing about you know, not being disappointed and going through trials and so forth. If we're not going to stumble if we see the light of the world. If we're, if we're following Jesus, we're keeping our eyes on Jesus. When we're going through these trials, these disappointments, things that don't happen, things that happen in a way that don't happen the way we'd like them to, we're not going to stumble if we're keeping our eyes on the light of the world, are we? Whoever, he says, you know, if you have the light, you're the light of the world, you're not going to stumble. You're not going to walk in darkness. You're, you're going to know where you're going. And when these trials come, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to fall. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. So, yeah, if you're walking in, in the darkness, if you're not following the Lord, if, you, if the light is not in you, if Christ is not in you, when you go through trials, you are going to stumble. You're going to say, you know, Lord, how, you know, God, how can you let this happen to me? You know, good old wonderful me. Why should, why should bad things be happening to me? Lord, where are you? What kind of God are you? You don't love me. Well, I'm, he's the kind of God that loves us enough that he is going to let us go through these trials and these difficulties for his glory and for our benefit. And we'll see as we go along here. Okay, so if you're walking in the night, in the dark, you're going to stumble because the light's not in you, because Christ is not in you. And this is he, this he said, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go that I may awaken him out of, out of sleep. Disciples said, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he'll recover. He has spoken of his death, but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. And in you know, several places in scripture, death of a, of a saint, of a believer is referred to as sleep because it's not, because death in scripture is usually oftentimes it's referred to as spiritual death, which would be separation from, from God. So to differentiate from that, a lot of times they'll use the euphemism sleep because it's you know if you're uh because it's not eternal death it's not spiritual death it's not separation from god so he's saying he's falling asleep he will recover jesus said to them plainly lazarus is dead and i'm glad for your sake so that i was not there so that you may believe let us go to him okay so it seems kind of harsh isn't it lazarus is dead and i'm glad that he I'm glad, but he said, I'm glad for your sakes. And the reason is because he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. So I'm going to show another sign to show you that I am the resurrection. I am the life. Again, he's going to, he's going to prove his, his deity by these, these signs, these miraculous signs that point to him and his deity. Go ahead, Sandra. Jim, um, I mean, I know the raising of the dead, there are several instances in the Bible, and I believe that, but um, there's another verse that says about it is appointed to men to die once or something like that, right? Yeah. Um, what does that ex exactly mean if, like in Lazarus' case, for example, <laughs> he, obviously he was he died and he, was, he rose from the dead and then he died again, right? right. Uh, so that's like multiple times. <laughs> Right. Yeah, that's in Hebrews 9.22, I believe, or 9.26. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, in there. it's Hebrews 9.22, I think it is. Um, yeah, that, that's a good one. Um, 
we we assume Lazarus must have died more than once. After Jesus raised him up from the dead, the, the Jews, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were trying to kill him again because people were believing in Jesus. So, yeah, it's probably safe to say that, that Lazarus did die again. Um, I, I guess I don't know, the best I can say is that this is just an exception. The, the general rule is everyone is going to die once, and after that, the judgment. You know, we have, uh, who was it? Was it uh, Enoch? Enoch walked with God, and then he wasn't. He was taken up in the whirlwind, so he, he didn't die. But for the 99.999% of the rest of us, you know, we are, we are going to die, and we're going to face judgment. And you could make an argument, those that are alive, well, yeah, and Paul said that. He says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So those that are alive at the rapture are not going to sleep. They're not going to experience physical death. So <laughs> it's another one of those that, that's kind of a, can be a sticky one, but I think it's making so it horrible. That verse means like in the majority of cases even though yeah. there are these exceptions like Enoch and Elijah, and then like you're saying, the rapture. Right. Okay. All yeah. right. Yeah. As a general rule, you're not going to get multiple chances. The, these, were, these were exceptions to, to prove a point that, you know, Jesus is proving here that I am the, the resurrection and the life. And then for Elijah and, and Enoch, that was to give a picture of the coming of the rapture someday. But okay. I think, I think uh, Hebrews nine. That's 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 a good one for those that you know believe in reincarnation, saying, "Oh, you know, I'm, I'll I'll die, I'll come back again, I'll get another chance, I'll I'll improve my standing in the next life." I think that's a good a good passage to share with with someone that thinks that you know they're going to get another chance, in another life. What that's basically saying is, you know, you've got one one opportunity right? before your your last breath. Put your trust in Jesus. Because after that is going to come the judgment. You're either going to this as your as your savior or as your judge, and, and we God wants you to see him as your savior. Yeah, that's a good way to use that scripture. Thanks, Jim. Sure thing. All right. So, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. John eleven verse eleven. But I go that I may awaken him out of his sleep. Um, let's see. Oh, down to verse 15. I'm glad for your sake that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, therefore, is called Didymus. One's been given that bad rap about being a, uh, you know, doubting Thomas. He said to his fellowship, fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him, die with Jesus. Now, that doesn't sound like a, a uh, doubter, does it? Unless he's, well, I say some pretty strong things too when I'm not right up against the fire. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds like a pretty bold thing to say. Let us go with him too, so that we may die there. You know, if our leader, if Jesus is going to die, let us go so that we can die too. Yeah. Or, or was he being sarcastic, saying, "Okay, well, well, let us go too," you know, so we can die? I don't, I don't know. Was he being sarcastic? I'm not sure. It, it, you could make an argument either way. Um, but yeah, good, good point. Yeah, we, we can, yeah, we'll, we make some pretty bold claims till the, till our feet are held to the fire. That's like Peter too. He said, I will never do this. And then he denied Christ, you know, when the time came. Amen. Yeah. So was, human, I think. I think it was oh, so. Yeah. <laughs> every one of us. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, every, every, yeah. Everyone. Yeah. We, yeah. Peter's the one that always gets credit for that. But yeah, every one of the disciples said the same thing. Every We'll never fall away, Lord. Even if everyone else falls away, you can count on me. I'm not going to fall away. And we put our feet to the fire, and man, we're going to crumble. And feet. they all scattered. Yep. Until like, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. amen. And then they were willing. Scattered like cockroaches. Till, yeah, until the Holy Spirit. Yep. Amen. Yep. So, yeah, we need to. Rely on God, rely on the Holy Spirit, rely on Christ. Not don't rely on our own strength, our own ability. You know, we're gonna crumble every time. So all right. So yeah, so Thomas Didymus said, Let's go also go so that we may die with him, with Jesus. 
Um, that, that goes back to, you know, verse eight, where the disciples said, you know, going to Judea and they're going to stone you. All right. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for four days. And Jesus knew that. He knew how long he's going to be in the tomb. And why do you think it's significant that it was four days? Why didn't he just go like the day he died or the day after he died? Why did he wait an extra two days? It seems like a pretty confirming thing. If somebody's, you know, it could have been that he just, uh, like the swoon theory for Jesus, like, well, he could have, he may not have really been dead yet. But four mm -hmm. days is pretty wrapped up in those, you know, clothing that he was wrapped up in the bandages and all. Yeah. That's pretty pretty good statement authenticity of death or something yeah yeah go, go ahead he you had something to share and make sure that he stink it he stink it yeah was it was it martha or i forget which one of us <laughs> said he stink it uh, yeah yeah they, he wanted to wait till the body was starting to decompose well, didn't he if you've got a corpse that stinketh it's a pretty good sign that it's dead isn't it <laughs> Um, yeah, you, you you hear reports even today where someone has has, has died. They said, oh, you know, he was dead. He was flatlined for 10 minutes or whatever, and they brought him back. That, that's pretty good. That's pretty remarkable. I don't know. I can't think of any uh, modern occurrences where someone's been dead for four days, where the body has actually started to, to rot, started to decompose, where they've been able to revive him. And that, that wouldn't be a resurrection. That would just be a revival. But it, that's so that's why they have... I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying, is that the reason why even Jesus himself rose from the dead after three days and not like right away or that same day or the next? Yeah, good question. Um, we know I think some of that is because of the, uh, like Jonah was three days in the belly of the whale. I think that was a prophecy. As It may have been, had other things too, but I think that that was a prophetic uttering yeah. as well. Yeah, it definitely was prophetic yeah he did say as Jonah was three days in the heart of the, as Jonah was three days in the belly of the fish the son of man will be three days in the heart of the earth so yeah it was prophetic but yeah good good question why you know why he could have said you know Jonah could have he could have kept Jonah in the belly of the fish for two days instead of three days but but yeah I I think I've heard and I don't know if there's any I had never confirmed it but I've heard some say that that the, in Jewish culture they believe that the, the spirit hovered over a body for three days and it took three days before they could be certain that this, that the spirit was going to depart. I, I don't know if that's why the, and I'm not sure where that comes from. I don't, I don't recall any, seeing that any place in, in scripture, but he, he, did you have something to, some additional insight? Uh, some culture hold like a wake for a dead person to make sure that they die before you bury them. Yeah. Yeah, th th and, and even today, don't we normally wait at least three days before we bury someone? Um, usually we do. And, and I don't know if that's the reason. Did we get that from Jesus, though? Did we adopt that from that? Or yeah. is there scientific or whatever other reasons? Yeah. I thought that the Jewish culture have to bury them within the same day before Sabbath, though, isn't it? Yeah, me like, too. You what? have to... Like, Hmm. Dot, like within 24 hours something like that hmm. yeah Me too. that's a good question i yeah i don't know about that we'll have to, but but anyway well, he was wasn't he he was, was buried today didn't joseph yeah, he, come and get, the day that he was dying yeah. right they took him down and buried him that yeah they had to bury right. him the same so, day good point right right they had to take but he him off rose three days. right he was three days in the tomb yeah Good right. point. Yeah, they did bury him that very day. Yeah. And well, one of the reasons they had to get him off the cross before the Sabbath because they, right. they didn't want to defile their land. That, that comes from, I think that's in Deuteronomy, which is kind of ironic. The one who created the land is somehow going to defile it. But uh, the sinless one. I'm sure there's some real significance about that, about it being the Sabbath and him... Uh, I don't know what it is, but yeah. I'm sure there is. Yeah, um, I'll try to look that up for next time. It's in Deuteronomy, it might be chapter 18, where um, the land would be defiled if, if 
uh, I'll, I'll look that up. It is kind of an interesting point. It's worth, it's worth looking at. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so yeah, he waited four days. He wanted to make sure there was no doubt that, that, that Lazarus is dead. He wanted to wait till the body was decomposing till it's, and it stinketh. And so there's no question that Lazarus was dead. And as a result of that, many, many did believe and we'll, we'll have to stop there, but we'll see that that they, the Jews wanted to kill Lazarus because many were believing on Jesus because of the, him being raised from the dead. So, all right, we'll, we'll stop there. Uh, any parting thoughts before we pray? Good session. Yeah. All right, would somebody like to pray for us? I will. Thank you, Tom. Lord Jesus, Father, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you um, just that you've revealed your word to us, Lord, or revealed yourself to us through your word, through things that you've done, and I just I just pray for like an unquenchable zeal to, to uh, seek after you, to be faithful, to have a relationship and walk in obedience to you so that we might bring honor to your name, that we might bring glory to your name. Uh, Thank you so much uh, for all that you do for us. Help us be faithful. And um, and just thank you in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tom. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Tom. Everybody have a good week. Bye. Bye, everyone.